So hi everybody, are we are we ready with the camera? No? Yeah? No? Okay, cool. So welcome to the first presentation of the video space. Uh, this is going to be a short introduction in the concepts behind free and open source software and why we think it's uh, very important and particularly relevant for you. You might have heard about the term free and open source software, and undoubtedly some of you might have thought this is all about getting something for nothing, right? About freedom. Uh, not about freedom, but about not having to pay a price. Uh, and that's in fact not the case for the term specifically. Free and free and open source software doesn't stand for free as in free beer, it stands for free as in free speech. As it happens in English, this is one and the same word. Uh, most other languages do have a considerably better way of distinguishing the two concepts. If you ever talk to your friends or family about free and open source software, you might do it in any of the four national languages of Switzerland. Each of them has a better way of referring to freedom as a qualifier than, than English. You can call it prior software, you can call it logiciel libre, or, or software libero. I don't know if you talk much about software in Romance, but here are your options. The second part of, in the term free and open source software is, of course, open source. Uh, and that relates to the fact that software, as it is run by your computer, is represented locally on disk. Uh, in binary form. This this means it's a string of ones and zeros which tells your computer what to execute, like what memory addresses to access and so on. This of course makes fairly little sense to the human observer. Uh, that's why when you write, read or write or inspect software, you look at the source code. This can look something like this. This is a very short example of a program in C. Uh, which, uh, which prints stuff on the display for you, right? Uh, this is why open source is important, because without having the source, if you look at this program, you wouldn't see this, which if you understand C, even if you don't, if you understand English, it's a halfway clear instruction of what it does. Uh, if you wouldn't have the source code, it would look like this. And this, of course, would give you no, no idea of what the program does. It's like a hexadecimal representation of the binary. Of course, you can try to decode binaries a bit by, by trying to read them as ASCII characters and so on, and that might give you like names or, or, or memory addresses or library names, but generally this is fairly difficult. People might try to do this to backwards engineer software. This is something which you might do if you have some proprietary software and you really want to figure out how it does. But um, unless the, the software is open source, it's very hard for you to tell what exactly it's supposed to be doing. And this is a big problem because you do a lot of stuff on your computer and you might want to inspect it yourself or at least you would want people to write it to formulate it in such a way that it would stand scrutiny. Uh, it wasn't always like this. In the early days of computing, uh, software was generally ruled by a more academic culture, meaning that people simply developed code together with the hardware and uh, it wasn't even thought of as like a separate notable entity, the software. Uh, most software was public domain in the same way in which um, the, uh, many other stuff which is passed around in academia is public domain. It didn't really cease to be public domain until a bit later when the number of, of court rulings together with the fact that uh, more and more software was distributed to non-academics, to business users or personal users, rendered the field very interesting for making a quick buck, so to say. Uh, so it became increasingly easy to withhold control simply because software became more reliable and when you got a machine you could pass along a binary with it and people would with a certain degree of certainty be able to execute the binary, meaning that not everybody needed the source code to understand what was going at all simply because at the beginning software was notably, notably prone to breakage so you needed to fix it along the way. Uh, two court rulings very notably determined that first bundled software is anti-competitive this means that hardware companies no longer uh, basically just supply the software with everything, and that was that. So at the surface, I mean, not, not just at the surface, basically this is a good development, because you don't want to rely only on the software of the people who manufacture your product, like many Apple users will, will be happy to, to confirm. Uh, but this also opened the way for companies to become pure software companies. Uh, and this, of course, together with a, with a later act, which determined that software can, can get a patent, 
meant that very many companies now had all the tools and the technical means to withhold the information of what exactly a program is doing from the users, from you. Uh, this led to a certain, um, to a certain back, back push from the academic software culture. This came from the MIT lab um, of, uh, I think it was, uh, what were they doing? It was uh, something with artificial intelligence, right? It was popular in the 80s as well. Uh, but what they become very no notable for, especially Richard Stallman, which is more or less the founder of the Free Software Foundation, is that they determined that this state of events is quite quite uh, negative and it might lead to a persistent loss of freedom of everybody who wants to work with software. And they determined that in order to counteract this, they needed to start a movement to promote and uphold four universal freedoms. The freedom to study, distribute, create, and modify computer software. This basically means that if you get a piece of software, you should be allowed to study. You should be allowed to understand what it does, yeah? uh, or use it simply to learn about computing. You should be able to distribute it, meaning that if you get a piece of software, you should be able to share it with the people around you. You should be able to, to create software, meaning that based on something which you have gotten, you should, you should be able to make this and distribute it freely, but also modify software which you already have. These are freedoms which are not guaranteed by a proprietary software model, software distribution model. So the Free Software Foundation was very important in raising awareness about these, these issues. Uh, they do have a very strong philosophical and, and ideological component to them. They promote a lot of social activism. You can go on their website and you will see that they are people who pride themselves in, in being moral and uh, they treat software with a certain amount of responsibility. However, very many people have accused them of being quite dogmatic as a consequence of that, of putting uh, ideology before pragmatism. And of course, this upset a lot of people. And if any of you still think that free and open source software is about hippies hating corporations, this is basically the movement which started that false impression. Because this hasn't been the case for a long time, and it's no longer the case now. Mainly due to the open source initiative, which tried to fix the image problem which the Free Software Foundation, which did a lot of good for the movement, but which it imprinted on the, on the free and open source software world by promoting an alternate term called open source. They have a list of 10 principles which are much more lax and, and less philosophical and they don't have such a long story attached to them. And they try to rebrand the movement in order to make it obvious, including for the booming technology software, that free and open source is something they should get in on that it's not a zero-sum game, that it's not something which basically stops them to take money from everybody, but it's something which can give them an avenue to create systems which generate value for everybody. And we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Many companies, due to the efforts of the open source initiative of fixing the, like giving, giving a facelift to the movement and promoting its, uh, its advantages in a very comprehensible and nice fashion to the business world, uh, are now in, uh, are now using open source in their business model. Neither IBM, nor Google, nor Oracle are primarily free and open source companies, but they rely on a lot of free and open source software, and indeed some of them produce some free and open source software. As of 2015, 80% of the contributors to the, to the Linux kernel, which is the main, uh, not necessarily the main, but the central piece of software on any Linux distribution, meaning on, on a good proportion of free and open source software distributions, is being paid by the industry. 80% of Linux kernel developers are paid by such companies as IBM, Google, Oracle, and so on. Also, people who are paid to do entirely different things sometimes contribute to free and open source software. So I think uh, it's, uh, it's, very good to, it's very good to keep in mind that a certain rapprochement to business was very beneficial for this movement, and we have the Open Source Initiative to thank for that. Uh, however, although I've presented a sort of schism in, in the free and open source world, it's just one from a very ideological point of view. If, in case you are someone from the Free Software Foundation, you definitely take a lot of issue with. Uh, but if you're just looking at the pragmatic work which is being performed on the computer, what kind of people collaborate with what kind of people, uh, the movement sticks together. I don't even know most of my collaborators whether they think that, that free and open source software should be a right which everybody is entitled to, or whether they just appreciate that it gets uh, the, the job done, simply because it's a very uh, hands-on culture of working together to obtain a productive goal, which is a plus-plus for everybody, no matter what kind of ideological corner you reside in. 
And uh, this is only the case for everything surrounding the world of free and open source software. Uh, the way in which a piece of software is flagged as being free and open source, but when the software becomes free and open source, is basically the application of a license. There are a number of licenses which count as free and open source, or rather as free and or open source. And the most prominent one is the license produced by the Free Software Foundation. It's called the GNU Public License. GNU stands for GNU is not Unix, so for all intents and purposes, you can treat it as a name rather than an acronym. And this license is a very, very long legal document, but it promotes the FSS for basic freedoms, right? So again, you have the freedom to run the program as you wish for whatever purpose. You have the freedom to study how the program does the work which you want it to do and whether in fact it does do the work which you want it to do. You have the freedom to redistribute, redistribute copies of the software to anybody. And of course, you have the freedom to take a piece of software, modify something in it, and pass it on to other people. This is, of course, very relevant to you simply because if you do this, people will do this back. And also the impre improvements which you make to that piece of software can become maintained by other people. So it's a very virtual cycle in a way, particularly this, this, last, this last item. Uh, there are other licenses coming more from the open source corner of the movement. One of the most prominent there is the BSD license. Uh, BSD stands for the Berkeley Software Distribution, and that's uh, an operating system for which this license was originally developed. Uh, and although the, the text here is a bit longer than this text, th this is like a severely abbreviated version of the license. The BSD license is incredibly short. Uh, and it basically has just three bullet points, and if you will inspect them, you will notice that the, the first two bullet points are about the fact that this license must stay on the product, so someone can just take your BSD license software and put another license on it, and, and then it, it's their product, or it becomes free software. Uh, and the last point is about making sure that you have no liability. This is a particularly interesting point simply because you might ask yourselves, why don't people just release software in, in the public domain like it used to be in the olden days? And the problem is that the public domain has a couple of issues associated with it, simply one, one of which being that people could just take your stuff and put another license on it. Another one being that you might be held liable. So this, this is basically the BSD license, one way to think about it is an improvement on the, on the public domain, which guarantees you as an author um, a bit of uh, certainty that your, your work won't just be hijacked, and a bit of protection, especially if you, leave, uh, if you live in such a litigious society as the United States where these licenses were originally developed. Um, a big issue, and I have touched about it briefly when I said that you can't just take BSD software and make it directly into free software, is viral licensing. Uh, viral licensing is a big problem, and increasingly so, with, uh, with licenses from the free software point of, uh, part of the movement, simply because somewhere along the way, they have resolved that uh, freedom shouldn't be an option. Freedom should be like uh, an obligation, uh, meaning that generally, when you receive software which is licensed as free, for instance, under the G uh, GP license, under the GNU public license, you have not only a lot of freedoms, but you also have an obligation. And the obligation is that if you do any modifications, if you make any work based on that work, you have to, pro to sell, not to sell it, you have to distribute it as free software in turn under the same license. Uh, the way this came to be is that people thought, okay, we want to make sure that the freedoms which people have now will propagate into perpetuity. Uh, the problem, of course, is that it removes the choice of freedom. Freedom under a copyleft model, which is why left is also a bit of a political joke, uh, is, um, is no longer an option. It's an obligation. You're after fashion forced to be free under the definition of free of a couple of people who aren't you have put down. And uh, this, this, these slides don't just mention viral license, licensing, they also exemplify viral licensing. Of course, this is theoretical. We're in an academic setting, so basically we're exempt from a lot of copyright law. But if we were subject here under copyright law for this presentation, you might have noticed that a couple of slides back, if you look at the gray text below this picture, you will notice that it is shared under a license, which is CC, stands for Creating Commons, is the name of the license. By means attribution, so I have to, to say where this came from, from this guy over here, and share alike. Share alike means that any work derived from this work 
will need to be shared under a license which guarantees the same freedom, right? This is viral licensing at work. If you now want to share a part of my presentation, which is not this slide, which is any other slide, you will also have to use a license which guarantees these freedoms, simply because I was already forced to. This is how viral licensing propagates, and this is why some people take issue with copyleft licenses, such as the license, uh, such as the latest version of the GNU public license. Uh, the reason why you might want to use software, which is free and open source, uh, unless, of course, I already had you hooked at the Free Software Foundation slide and you're now going to militate on the streets for me more free software use, is that it has a number of benefits inherent in the software. Uh, and the most notable of which is performance. There's a, a phrase called Linux Law, which means that given enough, which it says that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. This means that for free and open source software, which everybody can look at, bugs are much easier to spot simply because so many people are looking at the code. Uh, of course, people have tried to do studies trying to see whether this is the case, and some have confirmed it, some have not, but uh, generally, you will experience, if you do use Linux on your, uh, Linux on your computer, um, or if you will use Linux on your computer starting now, you will experience a lot less crashes. Uh, you will experience the blue screen of death a lot less uh, often. You might experience a blank screen of death, so I haven't gotten that for very many years. So although I do very experimental stuff with my computer, so you're pretty safe there. Uh, you get increased performance. You will especially notice that for older machines, for which like all of the details have been known for longer, and this more people looking to solve the same problem concept takes more effect. And if all of this still fails by some miracle, you will get a lot better support. Uh, if you have a proprietary piece of software, uh, the way in which you get support is either A, not at all, or B, you call a help desk, which has a flow chart, which is based on the premise that you're utterly incompetent and which takes forever to solve your issue if they ever get to solve your issue. If you need any more professional help, like someone to actually come and solve something on your computer, that will cost you quite a bit of money. And the reason why help is structured so ineffectually in the proprietary software world, I mean, th there are not a number of causes, but one of the big causes is that support for proprietary software is a monopoly. There's no competition. There's one company which owns the source code, one company which actually knows what's happening on your machines, and they're the only ones who can offer you good quality support. For free and open source software, generally, if you're looking for support, you get to interact depends on the size of the project, but very often with people who are close to development. People who have a lot of insight or are interested in the, the work they put in, giving you as a user uh, a good experience. And this will be manifested in very big IRC channels. So for instance, if you, if you do switch to Linux, or if you're already using Linux, your distribution most likely has an IRC channel. This is basically a chat channel on the internet which you can connect to and where many, many developers and many other users, some of them more, more, more experienced than you, will be glad to help you in a very hands-on fashion, which is very informed and which doesn't assume that you are utterly incompetent, which for you, I guess, is the case, right? Uh, so this is why it's, it, you get basically treated a lot better in using free and open source software. This one of the ways this manifests itself. You can also get help, of course, from us. Even if you're a newbie, the introduction is very, very gentle, and people will be there with you along the way to see that, that you make the, the journey, so to say. I remember when I started using Linux, I think I was 16 years old, and uh, I didn't have a lot of issues, and I was very annoyed when something didn't work. But even given such, a, such a difficult circumstances, people were very happy to help me. And now I have to say I'm, uh, I'm very convinced of the benefits of technological and, and social. Uh, another big part of the advantages of free and open source software is education. Um, some people, some, some of you might think that you're not programmers, right? You're not coders, you're not computer people, although that proportion might be lower in, in a class that just signed up for, for a Linux lecture. Uh, but even so, Coding is not like a separate sort of skill or intelligence. The same intelligence which allows you to be ETH or University of Zurich students can also allow you to understand what a computer is doing. It's not difficult, it's not just for technical people, and it's not a prerequisite of using Linux. You might have noticed that very many people who use 
Linux are good with computers, but the causality is quite the other way around. I was not good with computers when I started using Linux. I did not intend to become good with computers when I started using Linux. I did not even notice that I was becoming good with computers while using Linux. But many years later, I found myself giving Linux lectures. And this is simply because getting educated is made so easy that you do it by accident when you're using Linux. The interface is not designed to obfuscate the way in which the system works from you. The interface is designed to reflect the way the system works for you to understand and to be able to inspect. Um, so this, this basically means that if, you're, if you've ever thought that it's difficult to learn to code, it's most probably because you're trying to, trying to learn to code on, on Windows. I know I, I, was, I tried to learn C once back in the day when I was using Linux, uh, Windows, and I gave up very rapidly. Uh, whereas with Linux, you, you get some advice which says run this run this line on the on the command prompt. You do it, and then you basically already programmed, or at least you've copy pasted a bit of a program, so you know how it works. You'll be able to solve issues by yourself without even noticing that you're learning. Uh, you do learn valuable transferable skills, such as using the command prompt. Right, it's a skill which you can use to solve all sorts of problems in all sorts of platforms. Generally, when you write on a CV for your employer that you know how to use Excel, you're basically informing them that A, uh, you don't know anything about computers, and B, that you've invested time in becoming familiarized with an interface designed by some interface designer. You haven't really learned a lot about the computer. You've just learned to play by the rules which someone else thought that, that might be good or suitable to solve the issue. Uh, that skill is not transferable at all to any sort of program which is not Excel or which was not profoundly inspired by Excel. Whereas if you use free and open source software, you'll become familiar with a lot of, with a lot of uh, skills which you can transfer to solve all sorts of problems. Uh, the most valuable of which, by the way, is the command line, which you can avoid if you're afraid of it. I remember at the beginning, I was also super scared of the command line. Actually, I wasn't scared of it. I was very angry at the command line. Uh, but uh, now I can confirm that if you want to do serious work on the computer, the command line is the way to go. And it's, again, a change which, uh, which happened completely imperceptibly in my like, own development as a computer user. Uh, you, of course, get better software habits because you interact, as I said, via IRC channels. They are coming here uh, with people who are proficient users, users of computers and who use tools based on their uh, capability, not, not on the capability of the person, but based on the capability of the tool, right? So if, if you use a specific um, program, yeah, and I, I want to ask you, why do you use it? So why do you use Microsoft Windows? Or why do you use MATLAB? Or why do you use uh, Excel to come back to my favorite example? And the answer to that is usually simply because uh, someone showed you how to use it. It's what you are always using since time immemorial. Um, or, and this is like my, my least favorite, so to say, move by the proprietary software world, or because your school or your university was offered a free license in order to encourage you to use this product by the company so that when you leave your school and university, you will continue to use this product or go to companies which use this product and they will get more money. And that's a very bad rationale for using a piece of software, which is a tool. Imagine if I asked you why you use this, this hammer and you say, well, I, I use this hammer because everybody else was using it, right? Generally, if you use a tool and if you're serious about what you do with it, you should keep in mind that you should use the tool based on its merits. And that's what people who are good with computers do, and that's why when you interact with them, you will learn to use more open formats, simply because open formats are make your data accessible to people who are using whatever to look at it. Uh, you might learn about LaTeX, which is a very good system for, for creating documents, much superior, of course, than Microsoft Word. Uh, you will learn about Git, which is a superb uh, piece of software for version control. Uh, you might be familiar with this if you've already written a bachelor's or a master's thesis that you have a number of documents on your computer by the end called bachelor's thesis one, bachelor's thesis two, bachelor's thesis three, bachelor's thesis final version, bachelor's thesis final version one, and so on. Uh, and there's of course a much better way to do this. There's a way to track versions in a, uh, in a fashion which is much more transparent to your inspection, which is much more efficient from the point of view of disk space uh, and which of course it's, uh, is much more robust to data loss. 
And that's version controlled, for instance, by a git, but you wouldn't have known about this unless you at any point would have looked in what kind of versioning controls control systems are the people using who do a lot of versioning control, for instance, in, in editing software, right? And not least of all, the command line interface. A computer is great because it allows you to automate pieces of your work. It's difficult to automate a drag around and click around of buttons. Uh, it's much easier to automate a command line. So if you're ever looking to make part of your work more automated and free up more of your time, the command line is an excellent tool for that because the computer knows how to repeat a command line a thousand times. It doesn't know how to, I mean, it can be taught, but it can be taught a lot more difficultly, uh, difficultly to drag a mouse around a thousand times. Empowerment is also a very big advantage of free and open source software, empowerment for you, the user. Of course, we know that, uh, that knowledge is power, but of course, power is also power. <laughs> so it's, uh, it also, uh, it, it's also quite important that you free yourself on the one hand from vendor lock-in, so you're allowed to mac, uh, mix and match software as you see fit, judging not by who made the software, but on how well the software performs. Uh, and you also get other advantages, such as actually being in control of what's running on your system, right? Uh, you might know that like little pop-up, like Windows doesn't have a valid key, or do you want a security update now, and so on or other things with which you might want to get out of your way until such a point where you want to address them or which you might want to get out of your way permanently. Uh, that's a prime example of how um, proprietary software doesn't allow you to control your own computer. Even though you own it, you use it, you have physical access to it, you can't take out all of the components which you want. Why wouldn't you be allowed to do the same with the software? This is the sort of empowerment which free and open source software gives you. If you want to edit any single piece of code on your computer, you can. And if you don't know how, and if you don't want to learn how, although I told you that you might end up learning how without even noticing, you are very welcome to pay anybody at all or to ask anyone of your friends at all to do it for you. It's not a monopoly. Support and further software work is not a monopoly as it is in a proprietary model. Uh, and of course, you never have to ask for permission. Uh, this, very, this goes along very well with the previous slide. You get from, from the people who make the software, you don't get rules and obligations, but you get information. You get advice. Yeah? You get to ask for advice and not for permission. This is something which educates and empowers you, and something that can help you become a much more informed person by using free and open source software. Of course, innovation is a great result. From, uh, of, of both of these things, you know more and you're allowed to do more, so you can become more productive. You can automate workflows, you can make things which you need to do with the computer go even faster, and you have more freedom on the, than on the free market, I like to say, in, in choosing what kind of software you use. I mean, the free market is praised a lot, and certainly not without reason, but you have to understand that it's becoming, like especially in the world of software, uh, it's to some extent no longer as free. It's not just that governments are trying to regulate and control the free market, making it even less free. It's also that the free market is dominated by companies, also increasingly big companies, which themselves do the same thing which a government would do, namely make it less free. There's many more steps in between someone writing a piece of software and that piece of software getting to you so that you can choose whether or not to run it in a, in a proprietary software distribution model. It's not the same in the free and open source software world. You don't have, uh, well, first the, the, the author who needs to be hired, who needs to satisfy his boss, then his boss who has like a project to integrate everything into, which he needs to, to, to show to his boss, and the sales department deciding what to market how, and then somewhere at the very, very end, you come along saying, well, hmm, what should I choose between Apple, like between Microsoft and Apple, and all of the other options which I don't have? Uh, in the free software world, you have all of the options at the resolution of every single smallest tool, and you can make those choices based on what the tool can do, and based on how well it, it addresses your usage questions. That's what gives you much more freedom than in what we now call the, the free market. Uh, another huge benefit is security. You, can, you get the benefit from more privacy. And of course, the privacy debate seems to be going up and down and up and down, and nobody ultimately really cares about it. Uh, and perhaps with good reason, right? They're not doing anything illegal, uh, but uh, or 
certainly you're not admitting here that you're doing anything illegal, especially not if you have a microphone attached to your head. Uh, but um, the problem is that the difference in between you doing something legal and illegal is not just you. It's also the law. And uh, many people work under the assumption that legislators pass laws according to what the majority of the population wants, and the majority population wants exactly what you want, but, but that can change very quickly, right? For you to, for something which you like to do to become a crime, even if you like profoundly believe in democracy, all it takes is for 51% of the population to think otherwise, right? Boom, they're a criminal. Uh, so uh, privacy is not that a theoretical concern. And even if you think that a better solution to this is to remove privacy for everybody so that we can all have an honest debate, uh, it doesn't stop there. Software no longer just has read access to your lives, right? The more we start to depend on technology for self-driving cars or other applications, software has write access to your life. Software can impact your life in the physical world. And then it no longer becomes a question of, uh, of privacy, it becomes a question of, of safety. Uh, you certainly don't want to risk anybody, any company being able to drive your car into a tree if they so choose. Uh, using software which is more transparent is also a good plus for free and open source software. It's not just that you could look at, like you can look at the software, or you could look at the software if you're willing to. Seriously? Can we like, maybe not? <laughs> Did you do this? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so having software which is, um, which is more transparent in the same way, but, but really, I think we need to fix this. Come on, you can barely see what's there, and I can barely see anything. No? Is, I think this is it also automatic? Is this an example yeah, of software yeah, controlling like our lives? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dear God. Can, can we get some help, or we're not getting any help? So the people are already leaving. This is how horrible this is. <laughs> no? Ah, there was a hell thing. It said, ah, Nickel Dunkel Hell? Was this uh, Dunkel? No? Ah, oh, that's a Beamer. No. Uh, okay, well, as we are solving this, uh, it's also important that the software is trustworthy, and not just because you can expect, inspect it or that you could expect, inspect it if you like became so obsessed about finding out what this does exactly, uh, but it's also about the fact that software is designed in such a fashion that uh, it's built with people expecting others to inspect it, meaning that people won't even start to try to put in, oh, yes. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> Wow, this is so much better. Uh, people won't even start to try to put in backdoors and other things inside because they're simply not sustainable under a development model where everybody is looking at your code, right? Free and open source software, how could anyone even like realistically spy on you via the software itself, not, not via other channels, simply because where would they be sending the data, right? Because the software doesn't really belong to anybody, so it's not like they could be sending the data to the owners of the software who, who like, get a benefit out of the software. Right? <coughs> Someone in the community might come along and say, well, okay, I don't agree with the data of the users being piped to this address, which I know nothing about. Uh, not least of all, you will, ha you will have access to better encryption. This is not just because encryption standards are developed under a somewhat academic environment where inspection and review and transparency is important. Who would use an encryption system if they wouldn't know how it works? Who would, like, who would validate an, an encryption system if they wouldn't know how it works? Uh, but it's also that in free and open source software, because you need to interact so much on the internet, like in, in developing it, you don't need to interact as much on the internet if you don't want to, but in developing free and open source software, when you interact with other people, when you sign that one specific change comes from you, when you work collaboratively on, on a version controlled uh, project, you can't just rely on authentication for on like a closed infrastructure which belongs to the company and which is implicitly trustworthy. Uh, you do have to find a more decentralized way of authenticating, your, authenticating yourself. And that's of course what gives rise to a broader usage of, uh, of encryption standards and also to a higher user friendliness of in as encryption standards. Like if you're using a free and open source email client, they have excellent support for you sending all of your messages encrypted and signed. If you're using a proprietary uh, email client, that might be less straightforward. 
having said that, I'm not a big, uh, I, I don't necessarily use that much encryption, and you certainly don't have to, but if you're someone who is concerned about privacy particularly, then you definitely have more options and more solid options using free and open source software than using proprietary software. Uh, sustainability is also a very big issue, particularly to us, the alternative. It's also a rather innovative issue simply because the word sustainability is like a really overused and tired word because, of course, it's, it's like a, a slogan of ecologists and so on. Uh, the way in which we think of sustainability is very subtly but also quite profoundly different uh, in that unlike any sort of, uh, of material entity on the world, be it trees or rainforests or anything else, Human knowledge, which is represented and encapsulated in software, realistically has the hope to stay with us forever. So ideally, we would be trying to organize it, store it, and distribute it in a way which makes sure that all of this work, all of this knowledge, which went into designing a software logic or an algorithm or implementing an algorithm, doesn't get lost. In the same way in which we have huge libraries to make sure that our science and our research doesn't get lost in a way which ensures that we will never be less informed or dumber than we are today. The worst possible scenario should be that we stay just the same, right? And free and open source software does a lot in guaranteeing the sort of sustainability for any sort of human knowledge represented in software. Uh, free and open source software doesn't depend on any single entity for its continuity, right? Proprietary software, the code thereof is generally stored in secure locations belonging to the companies which make it, and due to things which needn't even be any sort of calamity, they might just be legal troubles, uh, bureaucratic troubles, technicalities, this information could very easily be lost or rendered inaccessible. That's, that's, not, that's not a sustainable software management format. Uh, free and open source software can be improved by everybody and degraded by nobody. Of course, you should take the, the, la the second part of that statement with a pinch of salt. Of course, it can be degraded, but only if everybody agrees that a wrong choice is the right choice. And even in that case, due to advanced version control, it's always possible to go back and review and remake old choices. Nothing is forever lost. And of course, it's reproducible and transparent. I know I had transparent on the same slide, that was transparent in the same way in which you want your government to be transparent, meaning trustworthy. This is transparent in the same way in which you want your science to be transparent. So not just trustworthy, but also quite comprehensible, so that people who are looking to reproduce it can reproduce it. Uh, the reason why reproducibility is a big issue here is that, as you might have recalled, I told you at the very beginning, software is distributed in a binary format. Yeah. Uh, which is a format which is difficult to read, interpret, like for a human, and to edit. Meaning that if you would just have binary software, then it's very hard to improve on that. Right? That's not reproducible. Also, it's, it's very hard to demonstrate where that, that binary actually came from. That's why free and open source software is so important, because you want to do on your computer, you want to do the same thing with science does. You want to do amazing things in, uh, in very well-documented and reproducible ways. You can also do amazing things in very ill-documented and unreproducible ways, that's called magic, but ideally you'd like, to be, uh, you'd like yourself to be, and you'd like people who make your software to be more like scientists than like magicians. Um, I can give you, of course, a couple of examples of what exactly is free and open source software, and of course there's too much to talk about in, in any one single, I don't know, uh, decade, but uh, there are very many pieces which make up a free and open source environment. And one of the central pieces, though not necessarily the main piece, definitely the central piece which allocates access to devices and memories to different programs is the kernel. This is the logo of the kernel, which is a penguin, which is why we have so many penguins around, if you've been wondering. Uh, and um, this kernel has originally been written by uh, Linus Torvalds. And as of 2010, only 2% <coughs> of the code of this kernel, which bears his name, is written by him. Uh, meaning that <coughs> Linux, even just Linux, not even to mention all of the software environment around it, owes even more to the licensing and to the concept and to the contribution and to openness than it does to the technical capabilities of its original author. <coughs> and this is the case for very, very many projects, right? You have a very good idea, you found a new interesting solution, and even a fragment of a new and interesting solution, 
this more free than the free market system of open source software also allows others to contribute with you and to make this ID sustainable and also the best it can possibly be. And the Linux kernel is definitely a great example for that. Uh, you also have uh, the GNU uh, environment, uh, which basically is why the correct way to refer to the Linux distributions, as you might have heard them, or Linux systems would be GNU, uh, GNU Linux or Linux GNU operating <laughs> systems. Uh, and this entire um, amount of software which sits around the kernel was uh, developed a lot of it by the Free Software Foundation, which is why it has this GNU name, which you might recognize. And there's very many aspects to it. There's very base, base level, very low level stuff, such as the GNU compiler collection, the GCC. Uh, there's GNOME, which is a visual interface for your computer, basically. It's what I'm running here. It's what very many of you who will be trying new Linux distributions will be installing on your computers. It looks and feels great. A lot more futuristic, I'd say, than the latest Windows even. Not that I've checked, but I definitely assume that. Uh, and of course, <laughs> And of course, you have tools for all sorts of other applications. So basically, how this started historically is that the Free Software Foundation decided that they need to make a system which is free simply because so many alternatives were proprietary at that time. And they built a lot of stuff on it, but they weren't done with the kernel. And then they took the kernel, which, which, Linux, wrote, which Linux wrote, and, and introduced them into the system, which, uh, much to their chagrin, has hijacked the name. Um, there's also GNU of Fave, which is a sort of, uh, of MATLAB for um, for Linux, there's also GNU Cache, which is an excellent manager for your own personal finances. It has like a transactional system that can keep track of everything for you. And unlike any commercial system you might use, you know that it's not sending your 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 tax information secretly to God knows who. Um, but there's stuff for for so many other things. You might like one of the very popular questions that you're starting off with free and open source software or Linux would be, can I do X, which I am used to doing on my proprietary system, on a free and open source Linux system? And the answer is almost always yes. The answer is sometimes yes, but you shouldn't be doing that exact same thing because this proprietary system has created very bad habits. Uh, but even so, uh, the answer is almost always yes. So if you're looking to for desktop applications, nice things with colors where you drag and drop your mouse around uh, and you interact with apps and everything, you have, of course, Chromium a very popular free and open source, open source version of the Google Chrome browser. You have Firefox, everybody's second favorite browser. You have LibreOffice, which is an office suite, which allows you to use uh, stuff like um, on, an Office uh, doc application or, or an Excel-like application, and all sorts of other things which you shouldn't be using, but you can use that as well. Uh, there's, of course, LaTeX, which is a document creation system, which is what you should be using to create your documents in a transparent and reproducible fashion. Uh, you also have plenty of multimedia applications. If you're looking to play play your videos, you can use MPD or MPD. Um, MPD is a music server. For instance, for me, it allows me to run it on like a small Raspberry Pi. It's one of those small mini computers at home connected to a huge hard drive and listen to music on my phone while I'm on the go without having to, to pay anything for that. Um, GMPC is a client for that, which I use, for instance, on my laptop, so that when I'm in the lab, I can listen to music streaming from home. Uh, BLC is another video player, and of course, if any of you are scientists, how many, how many of you here are scientists? Wow, that's very good, that's very good, that's a big improvement over, over the last couple of years. So if any of you are scientists, then uh, there's, there's tools to do every single thing which you can do with proprietary systems or frameworks such as MATLAB, and so much more. You might actually already have noticed that one of your first contacts with free and open source came via the venue of science, simply because this way of managing software is so compatible with, with academic culture. So you've got NumPy, which allows you to do numerical computing very fast, very efficiently on, on free and open source systems. You have Matplotlib, which is an amazing plotting engine for all of your graphics needs you can plot. 3D stuff, you can plot video stuff, you can plot, you can do anything, all sorts of things. We have NiPipe, which is a great example of how you can uh, benefit from free and open source, even if you're not using free and open source through and through. NiPipe is a framework for neuroimaging in Python, uh, but since there's a lot of neuroimaging written for MATLAB, which is more of a proprietary framework, 
uh, they didn't try to re refactor all of that, but they just wrote a transparent Python infrastructure, which gives you access to all sorts of other things which you might need. Uh, so even if some of the workflow is proprietary because nobody has gotten around to rewriting it yet, it yet or because it's super old, there's lots of benefits to be reaped from free and open source software at each level of the hierarchy. And everything which you do manually in data organization, everything which doesn't require a lot of, uh, of creativity each single time you do it, is reproducible by software, which is why you will find very, very many free and open software routines being built by people who simply want to automate their work and then being shared so that others might also use them and contribute to them. Uh, you, hold, you have a lot of server and cloud applications, Apache, OpenStack, WordPress, you might know WordPress if you have a blog. Uh, if you're into graphics like I am, you have raw therapy for uh, photo manipulation, so like uh, sensor photo manipulation where you edit like the raw data coming from, uh, coming from modern uh, DSLR cameras. You can have the GIMP, which is the GNU image manipulation program, uh, which is basically Photoshop, but free and open source, with, with the, the better support for scripting, which automatically comes from that. And you have Inkscape, which is a very advanced program for, uh, for vector graphics. I don't even know what the proprietary version of that might be, like Corel Draw or something. Um, who uses free and open source software? Except, of course, me uh, and you in the future, I hope. Uh, free and open source software has a lot of users who uh, care about getting stuff done. And pro probably the most prominent user of free and open source software is the internet. When you're going on a website from your small Windows machine, being restrained in your liberties by a company which, which assumes that, that, that you're not so, not so good with software and that you shouldn't be not so good with software, you're visiting the website of someone who wants to get a good job done and, and who's using a Linux to serve it to you. So most of the operating systems which websites run on are Unix-based, free and open source. Uh, not a negligible proportion, but a smaller proportion of them use proprietary solutions. Uh, and this, this trend is even more visible in the, um, in the web server market. So these, these are sets of the applications which serve the HTTP protocol to you. Uh, most of them, Apache and Jinx, like the, the two biggest of them are free and open source. You also have like this blue chunk here which contains both free and open source and proprietary solutions. And again, you have an even smaller sliver reserved for proprietary Microsoft solutions. Uh, we're presenting this chart each year and this seems to be a quite, quite, quite a stable balance. Uh, public institutions also use free and open source software a lot. They have a lot of, of course, a lot of interest in doing so. Uh, governments in particular have strategic benefits from using free and open source software simply because uh, if you're a government, and uh, especially if you're not the US government, if you're using proprietary software, that basically means that you're relying for strategically very relevant, <coughs> very important purposes on a piece of code, on a tool which is written and maintained and for which you can only reasonably get support from a US American company. Uh, if you're concerned about uh, power balances, that's a very bad deal, which is why very many governments are trying to use more free and open source software, especially governments which aren't that friendly with the US government. Uh, of course, there's economic benefits simply because this uh, usage of free and open source in your population, if, if, if you, think, you try to think of what benefits a nation, of course, may, means that people have better access to technology, have the venue in case they're smart enough, which technology has become quite simple to understand. So you don't have to be that smart to grasp it. Uh, they, can, they can look into, and based on which they can be very, very creative and productive. Uh, productive people leads to a better economy. A better economy leads to a higher status of life for all. So there's, of course, a huge economic advantage of people in a society using free and open source software. Uh, there's, of course, also a more subtle, but certainly a social advantage to using free and open source software simply because access to information about how software, which is becoming increasingly important in our lives, actually runs and how it's constructing and what kind of algorithms it executes means that people have more insight into critical discussions. Uh, especially if you're a democracy, and even more if you're a democracy which happens to rely a lot on referendums, uh, you want your people to be able to make intelligent decisions. And in a world in which more and more of the things which are happening are software dependent, you will need people to understand 
or software functions. You will need them to have a bit of a critical spirit and the information needed to critically evaluate any information which they're given about software. You don't want them to read about WikiLeaks and think, well, I don't understand anything about software anyway, and I heard the reporter saying that this is just a Russian hoax, so I guess I'll just believe that because what else am I going to argue for, right? You want people to be informed and to be able to tell if anything which they're told about software is, uh, is hocus pocus or it's the real deal. Uh, a lot more closer to you, two big public institutions which are relying on free and open source software are the ETH in Zurich and the University of Zurich. The ETH has a big cluster running on CentOS, the end open source uh, operating system. And of course, they have not only Windows, but also Fedora available for dual boot on all of their public computers. They definitely rely that, uh, on that as well, and they make it available to you for their use. Uh, the University of Zurich, very interestingly, has an open stack based computing cluster. For those of you who are scientists, and if you work at or, or with the University of Zurich, this is a very big computational infrastructure where you can get uh, resources for your project uh, so that you can start basically a virtual machine in the cloud and do your data analysis there, having access to a lot more power than you would locally. And the way in which they developed it is quite interesting. It's a very good example of how money can be made from free and open source software. They bought OpenStack, or actually they bought like a subscription copy of OpenStack, which is an infrastructure developed by Red Hat, one of the prominent free and open source software companies, which we'll get to in a second. And based on that, they had like an internal team uh, build a more advanced product, which specifically addresses the needs of scientists, right? And this is a sort of deal and a sort of development, which of course, enhances the productivity of scientists, so indirectly makes or saves money, wouldn't really have been applicable to a proprietary software distribution system, simply because if software is, is uh, managed proprietarily, this means that the only people who can help optimize the software for a specific use case are the people who write it, the people who have the copyright, Microsoft, yeah? So Red Hat basically gave them the source code so that people who they hire can make it better. If they would have worked with a company such as Microsoft for a copy of Windows to be optimized for scientific use, that would first have to land on, on the desk of someone at Microsoft who would ask, well, what's the mar market share for scientific use? And the answer would be not such a big one. So the answer to the offer, will you do this for us, would definitely be no. Yeah? However, if you can get the source code and if something is really important to you, you get to decide with how, how much money should be invested there, not a company which owns the privileges over the product. If you understand this distinction and why this is so amazing. I, I'm particularly enthusiastic about it because I'm using it. I can tell you more about it later. Uh, of course, businesses are also using and incorporating free and open source software in, in their products. You might be familiar with uh, Google Chrome, which is the logo on the right, and Google Chrome, like, and Chromium, right? not Google Chromium, definitely not Google Chromium, which is the logo on the left. And basically the way in which this, this came to be is that Google wrote a new browser called Chrome, and on the day they released it, they also released the source code as Chromium. Chromium is an open source browser which is developed by the community, which benefits from the fact that lots of bugs means, uh, lots of eyes means that all bugs are shallow, which benefits from the fact that people inspect it for security purposes, uh, and which is in itself a very good browser. And what Google gets from this entire deal is that every once in a while they take a dip back into this Chromium data pool and they pull it back into their own product where we, they then put a couple of other things on top which benefit whatever else they, they, they want your, uh, your <coughs> internet use to look like. Uh, and this is another interesting example of how viral licensing maybe isn't this good, right? If the only option would have been a completely free, and by completely free I mean not so free license, which doesn't just give you freedoms but also obligations, then Google would most likely not have released the source code. This entire business model and the way which it, why it is beneficial for both sides yeah, relies on the fact that Google can also benefit from the work of the community which has built on top of the work of their own engineers. Right? If this wouldn't have been the case, there would have been no incentive to do this. This also exemplifies the fact that nowadays, especially in a world as virtual as software, it's, it's never a zero-sum game. So for there to be a winner, there definitely doesn't have to be a loser. And I think this is a very good example where both the developer community and Google and of course all of the users uh, get a plus from this, this organization of software. There's of course also businesses which rely entirely on free and open source in their models, and the most prominent of which 
Also, the first of which is Red Hat. They were the first company to become publicly listed, having uh, an open source business model. Uh, and if you look at it, they've, they've, they've existed since 93, so a long time already. They're stable. They're not going bankrupt anytime soon. And if you look at their stock price, beta, this is basically an indicator of their stock price stability. You will see that they're a bit more volatile than, than other high technology companies, but not, not necessarily such a big difference. So free and open source is definitely very well integrated into technology at all levels, from the very lowest level, where so many applications are free and open source, up to the creation of businesses based on this, this software model. And of course, the, soft, uh, the, the products which Red Hat is offering, if you're wondering about that, are very diverse. They offer, for instance, OpenStack, which is this, this cloud computing interface I told you about. They offer a Linux distribution, which is, of course, open source. You can look at it. You can even redistribute it. But they have like subscription plans for business customers who want to make sure that if any particular minute anything goes wrong, they can pick up a phone and get right straight to the engineers. Uh, and, of course, they have a lot of other pieces of software, such as cloud forms and so on. Um, there's also an entirely different section of the population which benefits from free and open source software, and that's people who are persecuted or marginalized in any way. And you can imagine that for people who already find themselves in a precarious power position, losing even more power in an unconvenient arrangement with proprietary software becomes particularly easy to notice. Uh, and this, for instance, here is one of the 10 uh, principles of, um, of open source. Uh, I'll give you a list at the very end. I told you the open source initiative set up this list of 10, 10 um, principles. Number five is no discrimination against persons or groups. I think this also warrants a bit of an explanation simply because, again, currently no discrimination seems to be a, a slogan for a political section which doesn't care as much about freedom as they do about enforcing uh, uniformity, perhaps, at the cost of freedom. But in this sense, in the original sense, it basically means that everybody should be able to use the software or contribute to the software independently of other considerations regarding who they are or what they're doing or whether even they're a good person or not. Uh, one example would be criminals, right? So if you're a criminal, that doesn't mean that you're forbidden from using free and open source software. That also, not, that also doesn't mean that you're forbidden from using your skills to help advance free and open source software. A prominent example is the author of a very high profile file management system, Hans Reiser, uh, a number of years ago has been found guilty of con and convicted of second degree murder. He's of course in jail where he doesn't have any internet access, so obviously he can't continue writing the software. But if he should ever become free, and if the project which he left behind really sees itself as free and open source, there definitely shouldn't be any impediment to him, in spite of who he is and what he's done, continuing to work on this project and providing, of course, his services to everybody. Uh, a, a more notable example, especially if you've been thinking a bit about the privacy part of the presentation, is whistleblowers. If you're working in a big company and you blow the whistle on, on their software product regarding some uh, security flaw or some bug, you will likely not be working in, the com in that company for much longer. Yeah? Uh, although this is exactly the kind of person who people who want to deliver a top-notch product should want to have in their company. They should want to have people there who put the integrity of the service which they offer above the political interests of the company. And of course, this is the case in free and open source software simply because there is no political interest of the company or of the group because there is no coherent group. Whistleblowers are the, the ideal people for an open source project because, of course, the framework <coughs> encourages anybody who sees any sort of bug to be a whistleblower. Who doesn't want to be the guy who found that, that incredibly huge security flaw and helped patch it be, before anything bad happened? Everybody wants to be that guy. Uh, you can also think, again, if you've been listening to the security and privacy part of the presentation of political activists, if you're like a person in a country and uh, you're of the opinion that, uh, that your government is corrupt and someone should, uh, should do something about that or raise awareness to that fact or protest against it, if you're using proprietary software and if your government has good relationships with the company which made those proprietary software or with the government which has leverage over the company which made the proprietary software pro product, then you will find yourself as, at an even bigger disadvantage your government might be able to get your data from Microsoft, might have access to some backdoor. And of course, what goes for the little man also goes for the big man. If you imagine that you're a government official or a head of state, 
in, in a country where a small percentage of your own population, but a very big percentage of Western leaders have decided that your country would benefit from your debt, if your country's entire security infrastructure relies on proprietary software, then basically whoever controls that has the occasion to tip the power balance in your favor, but also against your favor. So no matter who you are, no matter what your goals are, no matter what like position of power is, everybody suffers a detriment from using proprietary software, and everybody can improve their position by, of power by not using it. Of course, these are considerations which for you might be a bit theoretical. Uh, maybe you don't have the intention of becoming criminals. Uh, maybe you don't even want to become whistleblowers or political activists. Certainly none of you, I think, have the intention of becoming controversial political figures, uh, but at least all of the other three points, you'd be surprised how easily you could slip in one of these categories, simply because whether or not you're a political activist or a whistleblower or a criminal doesn't only depend on what kind of stuff you're willing to do, but also on what environment you find yourself in. Uh, also, there's this tendency to, to expose people to certain repercussions or to deny them services, even if you haven't committed a crime, even if you're just like accused of having committed a crime. You have to bear in mind that the difference between you right now and you being accused of a crime is someone willing to accuse you. So I think it's, it's worthwhile to keep these categories in the back of your head when making choices which affect how much power you have in society, even if you don't feel they apply to you at this very moment. And of course, it also applies to people who you might better identify with or as, as a category of which you might rather see yourself, that's the Disney and the creative. I talked about how free and open source software, by the fact that it's dominated by tools chosen on the basis of their merit and not on any other considerants, encourages people to structure their work in more productive fashions and to have higher transferable skills. So if you're a student, you will benefit from a system which allows you to do your work more efficiently and which familiarizes you with tools of people who specialize in specific needs for the computer. If you're a scientist, then you will appreciate the fact that you will have more access to libraries to aid in your data analysis and that you can more easily share your own libraries and that data analysis work with other people. If you're an engineer, then that will benefit you, then this will benefit you perhaps even more than scientists, simply because as an engineer you want to make a product which does a job, and automation is usually a very big part of that. And free and open source systems give you a much better structure and better access to the information which you need to set up automated workflows. I mean, think about it. You have a, everybody here has access to a computer, yeah? which is basically a machine, which is at your whims, right? You can think about this as, as a sort of servant who, who doesn't need much, who never complains, who never gets tired, and who is so much better at doing repetitive work than you could ever be. So I think the amount of cases in which using such a servant doesn't benefit you in the modern world is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. You could be a writer, you could be a translator, you could be a processor of, of pictures, of all sorts of information. There's always something to be automated in your life. There's always a piece of work on the computer which you find annoying because you have to do it over and over and over again. A free and open source environment allows you all of the tools to actually make that automated. Uh, if you're an analyst, if you're trying to use tools which other people wrote in order to analyze data in a reproducible fashion, free and open source software is a great infrastructure for that. And as we've said before, even for artists, there's so much they even in art which you can automate. There's very many people who are developing automatic algorithms which make nice and interesting patterns for shawls, for clothing, flowery shirts, and so on. And this is all stuff which is very artistic, it's very creative, but it also can be automated in a certain fashion without necessarily cheapening it. And free and open source platforms do give you an occasion to do that as well. By interacting and benefiting from the work of very many people who understand how computers are actually working rather than just reading a user interface, you get the information which you need to find out how to do something the right way, but you also continue to have the freedom to do it your way. Meaning that, I'm sorry, I forgot to plug this in, so I'll have to excuse me for a second before my computer drops dead. Do we have like a power socket somewhere? No? Ah, there we go. <coughs> okay, so now that I have emerged... Oh no! Was I too late? I hope I wasn't too late. No, I wasn't too late. Okay, great. 
Uh, so you get the opportunity to, to learn how to do stuff the right way, to be informed and educated, but you also keep the freedom to do stuff in a way which is best for you and which might allow you to create an innovative product. And these are both, both points are points which you don't get from a proprietary format. You don't get the occasion to be informed, but you do get the obligation to play by somebody else's rules. That's not a good deal. As I said, you might be, from very many points of view, the kind of person, people, who might benefit from free and open source software. And the sooner you start, the better. Simply because, I mean, if any of you in the audience are older, and depending on how old you are, some of you might think that you're older with 25 already, um, you might think that it's a bit too late. You might think that, well, if I haven't started learning this computer stuff with 14, then it's no use. My younger brother, who is 13, is already better than I am, right? But it's not true. Uh, I mean, there, there are studies showing that the older you get, the more difficult it is to learn languages, but even if you're thinking of a programming language, it's called a language by, by virtue of an imper imper if you ask yourself the question, is it too late? The answer is definitely no. Even if you want to go all out and learn a programming language and benefit from all of the opportunities which the open source gives you, from the programming languages have a simple syntax and a very, very, very small vocabulary. You can be very old and still still be learning to still learn how to program. Yeah? They're predicated on the same kind of logic which you use for all other sorts of things in your life. It's not that difficult. What is true, however, is that the sooner you do it, the better, right? There's no upper cap, but the, the sooner you start, not only will you end up learning things better, but also you will have a longer amount of time at your disposal in which to benefit from the things which you have learned. Yeah? So no matter how old you are, don't give up, but no matter how young you are, today is still better than tomorrow. And the good thing about today is you've already started. You've enrolled, or you haven't, been, I don't know if you're formally enrolled, but you've, uh, you've started attending a series of free and open source software lectures, which in total value less than one credit point. Yeah? I'm not exaggerating when I'm telling you that this will be the most valuable 0 0.8 credit points which you take in your entire course at the university or at the ETH. And you've already started, you're familiar with the concepts. You know what it's all about, you know the power which lies behind free and open source software, and all you have to do really is to attend the rest of the courses to familiarize yourself with how you install it on your computer and how you can use it, like on practical examples, to do the work you want to do in ways which are possibly a lot better than what you've been doing up until now. So having said that, I would like to recommend all of our future events as well this semester. I think the next one is the day after tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to take questions from you. So, thanks very much.